Today, we're starting dipping our little baby toe in to calculus. We're gonna do this like as directly and like non-abstractly as I possibly can. So we're not gonna beat around the bush or try to show you like what's really going on. Like conceptually, we're just gonna work, focus on like being able to kind of do these things. Um, and the actual doing of most of this stuff is not terribly difficult in what they're gonna be asking you to do. So when we talk about calculus, there's gonna be like three things that we're gonna worry about. We're gonna worry about limits, and we're gonna worry about derivatives, and then we're gonna worry about integrals. Everybody okay? So today, we're gonna start with limits and one of the uh, very first ideas or stories that you get introduced to like anytime anybody talks about um, limits, thank you sir is something called Zeno's Paradox. Uh, so the idea is, say that you are, there's a race between when I was told this story as an undergraduate, it was Achilles, the Greek hero, versus the tortoise. And I can't spell tortoise. Is that how you spell it? I think there's an O in there, too. I don't know. So Achilles covers half the remaining distance. each second and the tortoise just moves like one meter per second Okay, so let's say here's our start and our end. In the first second, Achilles covers half the distance. In the first second, the tortoise covers one meter. So at this point, there's five meters remaining for Achilles, so his next second he covers two and a half. The tortoise, one meter again. Now there's two and a half meters remaining for Achilles, so he covers one and a quarter. The tortoise just covers his one meter. So now there is one and a quarter distance, 1.25 remaining for Achilles. So he covers what, like, uh, like, uh, I guess arithmetic is hard, guys. Where's my calculator at? It's going to be one of those kind of days. There it is, 
and the tortoise just covers one meter. So now there's 6.25 remaining, so Achilles covers half of that. And the tortoise covers just one meter. So there's now 0.3125 remaining. Achilles covers half of that. Tortoise just covers this one unit. There's 0.15 and change remaining for Achilles. Um, so he's going to cover half of that. Tortoise just covers his one unit. You're welcome. And this is starting to get annoying. Let's do it this way. Sure. So, if the total distance is 10, notice Achilles, after 10 seconds, still hasn't gotten there. He got off to a big lead, but that turtle eventually clipped him at the very end there. Um, how long is it going to take Achilles to get to the finish line? You know, like... We keep going, and if uh, our memory and our Excel sheet had enough space, that total distance for Achilles is never actually getting to 10. Excel is lying to us. A liar. Um, so the idea here. is that <coughs> it's 
Stop talking, please. Thanks. So Achilles just never, he's never going to reach the end, right? Um, however, what we would want to say is that, like, what, uh, what happens, or like, how could we get to the end, right? So if we graphed like our total distance traveled, that's like 10. The graph of Achilles distance traveled is gonna look like this, right? So to, what we would say here is we'd say like the limit as um, t approaches infinity for that um, distance Achilles covers should equal 10, right? We should say it approaches 10, that if we go kind of infinitely long, that's the only way we're going to reach the finish line, right? Um, so this is kind of like the idea of a limit. Um, let's talk about evaluating limits in So our big rule that we're going to be using to evaluate limits is this idea that if f is continuous at a specific value of x, then the limit as x approaches that value is going to be the same thing as just plugging that value in for x. Okay. This is our number one rule that we're going to be using. This is called the direct substitution. Um, so for example, if we look at the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 5, and we want to evaluate that, we have to first ask ourselves, okay, what does the graph of x plus 5 look like? Well, it's not horizontal, but it's diagonal. It's a straight line, right? What's the domain for x plus 5? All real numbers, right? So it has no open circles, it has no jump discontinuities, it has no vertical asymptotes. Everybody agree? And it's connected the entire way through, right? Continuous. At all values of x. Agreed? So what we can do then, since we've verified that this is continuous to ourselves, the limit then should just be 7. 
I can just plug the 2 in for the x, and I'm done. This is the simplest situation. If we try to do the same thing here, and you're like, oh, well, this is just works every time. All I have to do is this direct substitution thing. Oh, no. What did we get? What's 0 over 0? What's that equal? Not zero. Uh, not infinity. This is called an indeterminate form. There's actually seven of these. They're kind of, they become really critical to calculus. This would be the only one that I think you guys would run into. Um, what that means is you can't say anything about it. You don't know that it's infinite, positive or negative. You don't know that it's zero could be constant, could be a whole number, could be a decimal, could be something irrational. You don't know anything. Why didn't this work? When I plug, why couldn't I just plug three in and get a number out of this? What does that say about x squared minus nine over x minus three? It tells me that it was not continuous at x equals 3. That means there was like an open circle or a vertical asymptote or the graph doesn't line up. There's something going on there. So let's go back and think back to our Algebra 2 course. x squared minus 9 over x minus 3 is what kind of function? What's that called? that class of functions. It's called a rational function, right? What is the domain for this rational function going to be? All real numbers except for three. Why can't x be three? It would make you a zero denominator, right? We know that zero denominators you can't divide by zero, so those things, those x's couldn't be in our domain, right? What are we evaluating our limit at? Three, right? That's the problem because x because three is not in the domain for our function. Certainly, our function cannot be continuous at three, so this what we did here isn't going to work. What can we do with something like x squared minus 9 over x minus 3? We've studied rational expressions like this before. What can we often do with something that looks like this? What kind of number does this remind you of? A fraction, great. What can we do with fractions? Reduce, right? Simplify them, reduce. Can we reduce this rational expression? How do you do that, so people that are shaking your head? So we'll factor the numerator to x plus 3, x minus 3. And the denominator is going to stay the same, right? What did factoring allow us to do now? Cancel out what? 
the x minus threes, right? Now, if I look at x plus three, is that continuous? Everywhere, right? So now I can do my direct substitution, and there's my answer. Everybody's okay with doing this algebraically? Mr. Kulik, what if I'm stuck and I don't know algebraically what to do? Well, here's my suggestion to you. Let's graph x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. And we'll just do like our standard window or whatever. x equals 3 is right here, correct? If I just kind of trace up and then trace over, it looks like if I counted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, on the y is about where that looks like it's lining up. That'll do. Mr. Kulik, how come this looks like a straight line when I graphed it, but when I plugged in 3, it's like it didn't work? What's going on? Well, if we zoom in, To the graph right you know right near where that's happening just gonna zoom in a couple of times here a couple more times I guess Now come on, you stupid machine. Do what I'm looking for you to do. What is, oh, that's why, because it's not zooming. Okay, fair enough. Stupid thing. Zoom in, please. Oops. Zoom in, please. All right, I'm going to do this manually since the computer doesn't seem to want to help me out any. Oh, I see why. Okay. You gotta be joking me. I am so angry right now. All right. I'm using this. That's less dumb than that calculator is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really want to talk about this right now. <laughs> Look, that's hard to see. Yeah, you see the hole? Right there. This one works 
a little bit easier than your graph and calculator. It's the pixel issue on your graph and calculator. But there's a hole there. So that, that straight line on your graph wasn't actually a straight line. There's a little gap at x equals 0. OK. Now, what, sh what we've looked at here are two different ways so far to evaluate a limit, right? You can do it algebraically, where you try to do a, get to a point where you can do a direct substitution. Or you can look at the graph and just kind of go, OK, for what this x, the y value should be whatever. You can do either one. Both are appropriate. The third option would be to look at a table. Um, so again, I have this guy in here. I'm going to change my, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to do y1 of. And I'm going to look at what's happening as I'm getting closer and closer to 3 from the right. Oops. Right? And if I do the same thing from the left side, if I start with things that are bigger than 3, What does it seem like we're approaching? Seems like we're approaching 6, right? From below, as we get closer to 3, we get start going up to 6. From the right, when we start bigger than 3 and start getting smaller, closer to 6, or closer to 3, again, we're getting smaller, closer to 6. Now, why is this limit important? Because we're eventually wanting to talk about the derivative, which is simply an instantaneous rate of change. which is equivalent to the slope of a function at a single point. So let's say we have like this function here, and we have this value of x. If I was to kind of draw in the slope at that point, it looks like it's like that, right? But since this is a curved function, the slope is different at every single point, correct? Um, now remember, slope is like yep, this, right? If I use the same point, though, for y1 and x, or for x1, y1 and x2, y2, if I use the same number for both those, what's going to happen when I calculate the slope? I get one. I get, no, I don't get one. I get zero over zero. Oh, that bugger again. How are we going to get around this? Is we're going to use a limit. So like our x1 is going to be like x plus h. Our y1 would be f of x plus h. Our x2 would be just x. 
and our y2 then would be f of x. Everybody kind of see that? And by tacking this limit out front, we can now take h to 0 and look at what's happening. So like it's saying like, OK, here's my f of x. Let's make that oops, x, and we'll just make that like x plus h. So right now, we would calculate like this slope. But as h gets closer to 0, that point is getting closer and closer to x. And the slope then of the two points becomes closer and closer to the slope at a single point. And that's the idea. So the derivative is the instantaneous rate of change. A slope we're going to refer to as an as a average rate of change. ROC is just rate of change. So for example, you live 20 miles from school and it took you um, let, no, let's just do it this way. You live 60 miles from school and it took you one hour to get here. How fast did you go? 60 miles an hour, right? But you didn't actually go 60 miles an hour to get there, right? You started from a dead stop. You had to pull out of your driveway and put your car into drive and then like navigate through some, you know, some smaller roads where the speed limit's maybe 25 or 30. Get on the freeway, you go like, 85 miles an hour on the freeway because you're a terrible driver. You get off the freeway, you slow back down, you get you drive on normal speed roads to school. So you weren't actually going 60 miles an hour the entire time. But that was your average speed you're going, right? The slope is an average rate of change. It's just looking at in the same way it took us at 60 miles an hour to we drove, drive to school, but we really weren't going 60 miles an hour maybe for any long stretches of the entire drive, right? At least in the story that I told you. Does this feel okay? All right, so let's look at an example here. The distance between Lusaka and Livingstone in Zambia is approximately 500 kilometers. On vacation, it took one of the textbook authors five hours to drive from Lusaka to Livingstone. What was the author's average rate of change? Ah, so hard. Okay. What if we ask you instead this question? What's the instantaneous rate of change for the function f of x equals 3x minus 2? You should be able to do this in your head without writing anything down.
Who's got it? Three is correct. How'd you get it? It's a linear function. The slope at every point is the slope of the function, right? Which is three. If this was three x squared minus two, that's a whole, that's a horse of a different color, right? But if you have a linear function, the instantaneous rate of change is just gonna be the slope for the function. So let's look at another example here. Oops. Oh, come on. All right. The distance D in meters covered by a child traveling along a flat water slide along the ground after time T in seconds is shown on the graph. So this, I think, is a slip and slide. That's what they're describing. Remember slip and slides? Okay. I didn't know if that's still a toy that children play with anymore. Uh, it says, describe the speed of the child during the first two seconds. And then part B says, by copying the graph and drawing suitable tangents to the graph, find the speed of the child at points A and B to two decimal places include correct units. Okay. Let's do part B. Describe the speed of the child in the first two seconds. Okay, let me help you on how to think about this. What, it, what unit would the rate of change be for this graph, the slope of this graph? It would be in meters per second. Excellent, Megan. What is meters per second? It's a velocity or a speed. Okay? So the slope at a point is describing the speed of the graph. So like at this point, that's the slope. At this point, that's the slope. When is the child going faster, the first one or the second one? First one, how can you tell? It's a steeper slope. Everybody agree? So what's happening over time with the speed of the child? Is he speeding up or slowing down? They're slowing down, right? Each time, the slope is getting flatter and flatter and flatter, right? Why do you suppose they'd be slowing down? Yeah. It's just negligible because you're not going fast enough for it to really impact you. I mean, look at this. In two seconds, you're only traveling like three meters. You're not going very fast. 
Yeah, that's not the major source of uh, entropy there. All right. So let's do part B then. I'm only going to do one half of part B because this is pretty tedious. But what I would do is I would look at a couple of these slopes. So I'd say like, okay, M1 is going to be from 1.6.08 and then 0.8 and 0.2. M2 is going to be 0.06. Oops, that should be 0 0.06 down there. Misread my graph. Graph paper is hard to read sometimes, guys. She wants it, I had one sold that for a thousand billion bucks. So I'm just going to kind of look at successively closer and closer gradients. I'll look at some above and below and just kind of make an estimate based on that. Right? So it looks like this is like that slope at point A is like around maybe 1.2 or something. I just don't want to get my calculator out and do these. I'm just guessing, right? Because like, you know, like one one is there, right? And our slope is maybe a little steeper than that, but kind of close, pretty close to it. And I would do the same thing then at B. It's just tedious and time consuming. What do you think? Is that okay? Okay. Um, let's look at another example. Here it says in a laboratory experiment, a group of biologists study a population of fruit flies over a period of 50 days. The number of fruit flies is recorded at regular intervals and points are plotted on a graph with time t in days on the horizontal axis and n, the number of flies on the vertical axis. A smooth curve is drawn through the plotted points as shown in the graph. Oops, I needed some more here. There wasn't a question yet. On the 23rd day of the experiment, there were 150 flies. And on the 45th day, there are 340 flies. You need a fly swatter. 
Uh, compute the average rate of change of the number of flies from day 23 to day 45. Give your answer in three sig figs and include units. How do I do part A? Yeah, average rate of change is just slope. So which one should be the Y and which is the X, flies or days? Flies is Y. And you could tell just by looking at the graph above, right? And I guess that's about 8.64. Okay, uh, it says copy the graph and draw a line tangent to the graph at the point 23 comma 150. Use this tangent line to estimate the instantaneous rate of change of flies on day 23. Is everybody okay there? So there's my tangent line. Looks like maybe I have the point 2100. And then this one might be 26 comma 200. So for part B, I might say that slope should be 200 minus 100 over 26 minus 20. Is everybody okay with what I did there? So that would depend on where you draw this. Like There'd be some flexibility there, yup. Here's the, here's the good part, is I think in like one more section we're going to start learning algebraic ways to do this so we don't have to do this guess and check kind of graphically because it's L stinky. So let's see, when we did that, when I did this, what do we get? We got uh, 100 divided by six. So I got, we got 16.7. When the textbook did this, they got 17.5. So there's like some wiggle room there. Um, So this instantaneous rate of change we said was the same as the derivative. So for the function y equals f of x, we can say that We can write it as y prime. We can write it as dy dx. Or we can write it as f prime of x. All of those are acceptable notations to mean the derivative of y. Because what we're going to be trying to do, ideally, what we want is the derivative to be a function in terms of x that when I plug a value for x in, it tells us the slope of y equals f of x for that value of x. So we want the derivative really to be a function that outputs the slope for any value of x.
So far, so good. look at an example. So here we're told a ball is thrown upward from the roof of a building. The vertical height of the ball from the ground in meters after t seconds is given by the function h of t equals yada yada yada. The derivative function is given as h prime of t equals yada yada yada. Find the initial velocity of the ball. So h of t, if I think about the graph of h of t, uh, let's say, I am shocked that it didn't, okay. So this is like our graph of y equals h of t, right? It's going to be a height comma, or a time comma height graph, right? What is the derivative unit going to be? It's going to be some distance or height per time, right? Is everybody okay with that? Otherwise known as a velocity. Everybody's cool. So if I want the initial velocity, what is the value for t for initial? Initial is telling you a time, not 50. Zero, right? That's before you do, like as you're tossing the ball, like the instant it's leaving your hand, it would be your velocity. So we're doing h prime of 0. So that should be 18 meters per second. Again, I know it's meters and seconds because it tells me in the problem. Part B says find the time at which the velocity of the ball is 0. So I want to solve this equation for t. How would I solve that for t? Subtract 8 and then divide by negative 9.8. Uh, yup. Thanks. Makes that 1.84 makes a heck of a lot more sense when it's 18 divided by 9.8 than 8. Now it says interpret the meaning of this. What would that time represent? Yeah, so you throw the ball up. It's getting fast. It starts off fast, but it starts slowing down due to what's going to be slowing the ball down? Gravity, and eventually heads back down, right? So that's going to represent where the ball reaches its maximum height.
and then part C it says find the velocity of the ball at the moment it hits the ground. So here, that's when h of t is equal to zero, right? Everybody agree? So we're going to solve h of t equals to zero, and then use that value of t into h prime of t. to get the velocity when it hits the ground. Is that okay? So we say 0 is equal to negative 4.9t squared plus 18t plus 50. How do I solve that equation? I would use the quadratic formula if I heard somebody whispering it. Was that you, Megan? It was Alexis. Good job. Do we all remember the quadratic formula? Do we need to write it down again? How many solutions are going to come out of this? Two. What's one of them going to be? Negative. Do I care about the negative one? Why not? Can't have negative time. So we'll just care about that one. And then we'll do h prime of that. And when I do that, I get They're doing all this stuff before they do that. Oh, there it is. Finally. Okay. Maybe. All right. I'm going to stop here because, uh, well, I don't want to get into the next thing. I think two sections in one day is probably sufficient, especially when it's something we haven't really done before. So we've covered sections 9.1 and 9.2. You should do the associated practice problems for those two sections. Um, 9.1 is 1 through 7. And 9.2 is numbers 1 through 5. And seeing as none of us have ever done this before, should really actually do the problems and not just copy the answers out of the back of the book. Who does that? I don't know. Sometimes it feels like when you just get a list of answers turned in as your homework that some of us are doing that. Okay, but that's... It's all Diego's who's doing that. Okay. Um, Really try on these. Come with questions next time. This is brand new. We're going to build on this. The next three chapters are all these beginning calculus ideas. Um, so I would say we're having like a cup of coffee with the topic of calculus here for the next three chapters. Um, don't worry, it'll be decaf. So nobody's going to get like a double espresso. Okay. I'm going to stop.